Okay, welcome to Calvary Chapel Comic Key once again. Today's the 6th of December 2020. It's my granddaughter's uh, 10th birthday, so it's a special day in my family household. We've already celebrated her birthday early this morning, and that will continue after church as well. But we'll continue in our study of Ephesians. So if you want to turn to chapter 5, and really we've been um, in the passage from verse 21 to the end of the chapter for a while, and today. Uh, Lord willing, we'll finish that up. But it's, it speaks a lot about this analogy of the husband and the wife as a perfect, beautiful picture of Christ and his church. So remember, the church is also known as the bride of Christ. So when we think of those terms, then, then we see, okay, I see how when the Lord, through his word and the working of the Spirit, speaks of husbands and wives and children and uh, employees and employers and, and all these things that we'll get to even in chapter 6. The main focus is the husband and wife, the family unit is in many ways a picture of Christ and his church. And so let me just skip down to verse 32 uh, because this is kind of a reminder of the, about this passage. It says, this is a great mystery, Paul says through the Spirit, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he has just spoken of wives and husbands and how uh, this loving relationship is a perfect picture of the loving relationship of Christ and his church. So we know that Christ loves his church. He proved that on his cross, but he proves it every day. And he does things in his church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, uh, men, women, children, all born again by the Spirit, regenerated uh, the church of God, if you will, in Christ. That's very, it's a spiritual thing. And so he's gifted all of us. And so when we come together as his body, as his bride, uh, even in a holy convocation of this assembly, even now, then the Lord is um, excited to have his spirit work in us as we now communicate with each other, as we do life together. And so that's especially how the church should and can be a light in a dark place, a light in their community. Wherever the local churches, the local assemblies are, are gathered, wherever we live, wherever we move about, our regular everyday stuff, uh, we can do things like, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All these things that the Lord commands us to do, we can do that because it was his idea. And if it's his idea, meaning that he commands that, then he gives us his spirit. He gives us his word so that we can walk in his power to perform those things. So when I read that I'm to love my wife as Christ loved the church, I can be honest and say, well, wait a minute, that's impossible. But the Lord will say, I've already done that. Now watch me. I am your perfect example Live your life looking to me, trusting me, and, and there will be this growing transformation by the work of the Spirit, this renewing that's ongoing day by day, moment by moment, that I can actually now live out what I'm commanded to do. Uh, but I can be honest, I, I can say that I fail often, even as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, but the Lord has given his grace so that's a foundation that I walk on. I walk on his grace. I live in his grace. Uh, I love his mercy that's new every morning. So we have this marriage relationship. And so let me go th through some notes. But it goes way back to Genesis. Remember when God created. First he created, you know, light. And then eventually the animals. And then finally man. And let's go to Genesis chapter 2. I want to go right back to the beginning. You know, Right in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to see some things that are a great reminder that even Jesus himself used when he was questioned about, you know, marriage and divorce. Uh, look at uh, chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So important. Uh, and then there's this garden that he creates to put him in. And um, verse 19, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. So uh, that shows that Adam, the first man in Hebrew, is ish. 
he was very intelligent, and God let him name the animals. And it says, and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle and the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Oh. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. In Hebrew, that's Isha. So you have man as Ish, and Isha, the woman, because she was taken out of the man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You know, that's a very important verse there. Now, it's almost like it causes me to giggle when I think about Adam and Eve. It says that a man of, the man and wife should leave their mother and father. Well, they didn't have one. God created them. They're the original, but that's going to be a pattern then from then on, uh, which speaks to there's confusion even in church teaching uh, about, you know, uh, the husband and wife and their role with the parents. Uh, yes, we're to honor our mother and father. That, that's for sure. That's one of the Ten Commandments. But there can be confusion about um, when it comes to when a, when a husband and a wife become one flesh, the two becoming one, then what is the parent's role? What is, uh, what is that new unit, the husband and wife, um, their part, their role with their parents? And so it's very clear that they are to leave their parents. In other words, they are a standalone unit in, in, a, in a sense. It's very powerful. And uh, when I reflect on when my wife and I were first married, I was already in the military, and my wife grew up in one city in the United States, uh, St. Louis. We would say St. Louis here. Um, and that's all she really knew about. And so I was a military brat growing up. I moved my whole life. But as soon as we were married, since I was in the military, we moved uh, like a 12 and a half hour car drive from where she grew up, where our parents were at the time. And, you know, back then there's no cell phones, there's no internet, there, you know, no computers, uh, just the old fashioned things, you know, a phone call, you know, a landline and, and writing letters. Remember that some of you, those type things. Um, but what that did for Karen and I is we were far enough away from our parents. We knew that they loved us and we honored them, but we were separate from them and we had to learn to, to get through life. You know, uh, especially the difficult situations. And so, so be encouraged if you're married and, you know, especially for young couples. Yeah, honor your mother and father. But, you know, the Lord has ordained the, the family unit, the husband and the wife. And then when kids come along, and, and we'll get that to that in chapter 6. Um, and so that's just a snapshot of looking back to the original. But, you know, back in um, Ephesians... You know, I'll just, I'll just do some review. In verse 21, I think this really is the foundation of this passage. Submitting to one another in the fear of God, that's everyone. So when, when verse 22 comes along where it says wives submit to their own husbands, you know, the, the women can cringe. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Well, but, but the bigger fact is that we are all to submit to one another in the fear of God. So that's a review. Uh, and the husband is to love their wife as Christ also loved the church. And how? He gave himself for her. Christ gave himself for the church. Now, so as we proceed through this, it can be confusing because we're talking about husbands and wives quite a bit. But the bigger picture is, this is a picture of Christ and the church. This is really the precept that we need to glean from this passage. And so what about those of us in this room right now that are single? Maybe you're divorced. Maybe, maybe you've never been married. How do I fit in? Well, we submit to one another in the fear of God. That's the foundation. But we, are, we do everything as we're serving unto the Lord. See, the Lord Jesus is preeminent. He's the priority. He's what our life is about now. Those of us who have been born again by the Spirit of God, now it's Jesus as our focus. And one important part of that focus is his imminent return. See, we see in Scripture that he's coming again for his church, for his bride, and it can be at any moment. Uh, Jesus actually says it will be like a thief in the night. But we see in Scripture, for those of us, his church, the spiritual church, 
worldwide, we don't have to be surprised by that. We're anticipating that. In fact, we're excited about that, some of us more than others. I can tell you, uh, as de each day and each year goes by in my life, I'm so excited about the thought of being with the Lord. And I would love to be uh, part of the generation that would be gathered together. You know, some would call it the, the rapture, but we're snatched away. Um, we see that in 1 Thessalonians and, and other places in Scripture, like 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But we'll have a glorified body. I'm very excited about all these things that is our future in the Lord. It's very brilliant. You know, I could say, like, when you walk out into a sunny day like today, and I say this to my wife sometimes, I said, hey, man, this reminds me of your future. It's very bright, right? Uh, our future in the Lord is very bright. It's brilliant. And we better have some good sunglasses or we're going to go blind because, you know, these bodies can't, can't handle what's ahead of us. Uh, the brilliance of God's love even in his, in his presence, this pure light. And so, so these things that we've talked about, but marriage is uh, supposed to be undefiled and held in honor. See, this is something when we, when we catch the um, reference of husbands and wives as a picture of Christ in the church, we see how important uh, that is in the eyes of the Lord, this relationship, the marriage relationship. It should be honored. So if you're single here today, be praying for married couples. You know, um, I believe that the enemy wants to separate. He wants to conquer and divide uh, husbands and wives. And so, so whether you're married or not, we should be praying for marriages. You know, Lord, would you bless those marriages? Like last week, just a renewal of the vows for Takeshire and Lizzie. You know, that's a cause of rejoicing, but it's also a cause of prayer. Um, we can consider every time that we take in truth from the word, the enemy will want to attack that. He will want to come in and cause fear and doubt. He will, he will come in and try to take us out. And so even a ceremony like last week, you know, this 25-year anniversary and a wedding ceremony, renewal of vows, the enemy doesn't like that. He wants to come in and, 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 and mess that up. So let's be praying for Takeshire and Lizzie. Uh, but in general, all the marriages we should be praying for, and we should be praying for everyone. But I'm just bringing out the point that uh, in Scripture we see that the marriage, the husband and the wife, it's very important in the eyes of the Lord. And it can be a picture, a snapshot of the church. And so the title of today's message, finally, after all this time of speaking, is Signs of a Healthy Church. So, so a snapshot of what a healthy church can look like, because the church is the body, the bride of Christ, would be a healthy marriage. A healthy marriage would be one that the wives are actually submitting to their own husbands in the fear of God. It's a healthy thing. A healthy church um, would have the husband that's loving his wife uh, as Christ loves the church, that he would be serving her. See, in some uh, cultures, the word serving is a bad word, not in the Bible. Uh, see, the Bible supersedes culture and different societies and different you know, even language groups or whatever, people groups. The Bible is absolute truth. So a healthy church uh, can look like a healthy marriage and vice versa. A healthy marriage can look like a healthy church. So a healthy church, uh, regardless of size. See, my, one of my number one prayers for us as we gather as Calvary Chapel Comakey, that we would be healthy in the Lord. Uh, I don't necessarily pray for big numbers, you know, uh, but the funny thing is when pastors talk and they say, hey, how was church last Sunday? Many times the translation means how many people did you have? You know, uh, you know, so if I say, well, we had about, yeah, it was awesome. We had about 20 people. And, and then some people would judge that. But, you, you know, the statistics worldwide um, is, is actually eye-opening. 90% uh, of all churches in the world uh, have less than 200 and 80% of churches worldwide have less than 50. So it's not about size. It's very common. Uh, and there's good things about large churches. There's good things about small churches. But, but our heart and our prayer should be, Lord, have us to be a healthy church. Lord, help us by your spirit and by the, as we're in your word, that we're growing in your grace and in your knowledge. That, Lord, we have this growing even understanding about 
your love and your grace, your, the characteristics of you, Lord Jesus. Lord, as you develop those characteristics in us, we know that we become healthy. And so a healthy church should be our, our number one prayer. But Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. So, so we see in Scripture that marriage should be undefiled, and it's honorable in the eyes of the Lord, especially a healthy marriage. So as I'm saying these things, maybe you're like me, all of a sudden I, I'm thinking of people that I know close in my life that have an unhealthy marriage. So what do we do about that? Well, number one is we should be praying for them, but we need to bring the love of Christ into that, into that sphere. Uh, as much as the couple would allow, you know, sadly for Karen and I, we've done plenty of marriage counseling in our years, you know, in ministry. And, and many times it's only one person that's willing to go through counseling. But, but so you just love them right where they are, just like Christ does for us. You know, he's always the example. Um, marriage should be marked by a loving servanthood attitude, attitude toward one another. So, so it, as I'm loving my wife and she's loving me, and that's a, it's an ongoing, it's a, it's a two-way, you know, as we're one and we be, become closer, uh, that's also a snapshot of a church, a healthy church. A healthy church um, has people in it, right? So we can be honest, and, and some people would say people will be people, meaning, yeah, you're going to get hurt, you're gonna, there's going to be difficult things. But God has in his plan that church life should be something that's, that's loving. So as we walk in like this doorway, you know, when we sign in right now, we take a temperature, we're wearing a mask, all these things that we have to do, you know, the weirdness of today, what should supersede that is loving each other the way Christ loves us. Remember, uh, we love him, but he loved us first. We see that in 1 John. And so, uh, and so this attitude of, of even serving a spouse, you know, the, the healthy marriage, the husband and wife, they're serving each other. Just like in a church, a healthy church, we will be serving each other. You know, in a conversation, quickly, I want to get into, hey, how can I pray for you? Uh, are there any things you're struggling about? Is there anything that I can help you with? If I've trespassed, if I've, if I've sinned against a brother or sister, I'm quick to go and repent. And, and I'm, that's not just... Uh, lip service, that's going to be lived out. I, I'm going to show a change of heart and, and attitude toward that person by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we serve each other. Um, and I've already said it, but Jesus is the example of servanthood. You know, we can turn to Mark chapter 10 if you want to, the gospel of Mark chapter 10. Sometimes it's nice to be reminded of these Bible verses, you know, and always check your Bibles. If there's things that I'm saying and you're not, you're not sure about, go to the Word. That is, that's where we, we find the truth. Mark chapter 10, verse 43 and following. I'll even back up to verse 42. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Verse 43. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, you shall um, among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So the example of Jesus, he came to serve and not be served. And so that should be our. Uh, our heart attitude coming into a church gathering. So a healthy church is going to be serving each other. Uh, so I've got this list, and I'm sure I found it in an article. It may have been from a, a magazine called Christianity Today years ago. So I didn't write down the reference, but it's, it's not mine. But I've tweaked it uh, to where we are today. But I have five things that sum up what a healthy church can look like. And so I have five things. Number one would be uh, a healthy church is going through the full counsel of God, the whole Bible. And that's one of the distinctions of Calvary Chapel. We teach the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation. We believe it's all 
a part of one unit, the Word of God. And so, so we honor that by teaching the whole Word of God, the whole counsel of uh, of God. We see that in Acts chapter 20 where Paul is talking to the uh, elders in Ephesus on the beach at Miletus and he says, I did not uh, shun to give you the whole counsel of God. You know, uh, and so uh, the word of God is very important to us. And so a healthy church is going to be in the word of God. You know, if you're like me, I've been to churches where not only do people not bring their Bible, but the the pastor and his staff are are on the same page that they're asking people, especially leadership, do not carry your Bible. That's going to offend people. Do you know that's happening? You know, at least in my country. Uh, and so, so we're a church that we welcome. Hey, bring your Bible. Bring your sword. You know, we're going we're gonna to learn about that in chapter 6 of Ephesians. It's, it's the sword of God. It's, it's the word. And, and so, so we carry this because we have an enemy that's trying to kill us. So I'm in the word. And so just like Jesus, uh, when he was uh, brought to the desert, the wilderness, by the Holy Spirit, we, we see that in Scripture, and he was tempted by Satan, what did Jesus do? He quoted Scripture. So not only is Jesus the word, we see that in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, and so on, and became flesh. But Jesus quoted the word against the enemy. And so, so I'm going to keep my sword with me, very close to me, and I'm going to be in it often. It's like the bread of life. It's, it's like my daily food, Job would say. So number one is solid Bible teaching of the whole wor uh, word. Number two, genuine relationships. We're, we see that already where we are. You know, really, um, Ephesians, where we are, and then following where it's going to talk about children and so on. Those are talking about interpersonal relationships. So, so a healthy church will have genuine relationships. It's going to be more than just a sunny Sunday morning. It's going, you know, here in our our culture and with the technology, it's it's going to look like WhatsApp. It's going to be like tea somewhere. It's going to be connection. Uh, that's a healthy uh, church attitude. Genuine relationships, not just in the surface, and so. So we, we can be real. We can be honest. We can, I can say, man, I'm really struggling. You know, I can tell a brother, man, be praying for me. And, and so a genu genuine relationship would be receiving that and say, okay, bro, man, I'm praying with you, man. I'm going to battle with you. I'm going to be engaged in this with you. I'm going to stand with you. I've got your back. See, that's genuine. That's real. And, and so, so not only is my heart about teaching the whole word of God, but my heart would be a healthy church that we have real relationships. In other words, another way of saying it, this would look like a real family, a real family where we know each other. You know, we hurt with each other. We rejoice with each other. Okay, number three, uh, there's going to be practical ministry opportunities. And I can tell you, I'm the guy that when I'm talking with people one-on-one, -on -one especially, like when I'm meeting with a brother, or sister, it doesn't matter. And in the conversation, I'm actively listening. Okay, what are their spiritual gifts? You know, what are, what are their passions? What do they want to do? How, do, how is the Lord uh, calling them? What does that look like? And I want to be the guy that, hey, man, let me help you with that. You know, do you have a heart for uh, the homeless? Let me get you set up with serving the homeless. What, you know, fill in the blank. It doesn't matter. And so... Practical ministry opportunities. So in other words, this is not a closed meeting. It's not just a handful of people. We know each other and now we're happy and no one else is invited. No, that's up to the Lord. See, it's the Lord's church and he will add to his church daily those being saved. Okay, so practical ministry opportunities. If you're wondering how do I fit into this little body here, come ask me or, or my wife. And, and uh, you know, we'll pray with you and we'll, we'll, get you, we'll get you going. Okay. Number four, um, helpful conversations about important issues. Okay, so a healthy church not only has genuine relationships, but that's going to, you can add to that, uh, conversations about real things, important issues. You know, right now we have COVID worldwide. Uh, we have... Uh, worldwide, these issues about uh, gender, you know, uh, we have poor young kids that they're being told, well, you don't have to decide if you're a boy or girl now. Those are real issues. 
that we can talk about and we can pray about and we can go to the word. And, you know, everything from the word is going to be beautiful. It's going to be pure. It's going to be perfect. And everything that we say from the word is going to be with grace seasoned with salt. That's just one little snapshot. It's going to be bigger than that, that even. So, so conversations about important issues. Uh, right now, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays here, right in this room, uh, Gail and my wife, they, they have what they're calling couch corner. And uh, some of you ladies have come. That's a perfect opportunity to do things that we're talking about, where you can grow in a relationship and you can talk about real life situations, you know, and just pray about it and, and be in the word. And so, so I'm available for the guys, you know. Uh, if you don't have my, my phone number, please ask me for that. You know, I will make a way in my schedule to meet with you. Uh, and I do that with some of the guys regularly already, but, I, you know, that's one of my passions. And then finally, and we did it this morning, sincere worship. So sincere worship doesn't necessarily equal uh, professional quality, you know, like this morning. But you know what? I, I enjoyed the audio where I pushed play and we sang. But I enjoyed it even that much more when we weren't doing that. And I could hear your voices and you all were singing, you know, even through your mask. And, and so... A healthy church will have sincere worship. You know, we're told in Scripture that we must worship the Father in spirit and in truth because he is spirit, and Jesus himself is truth. So we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. So when we come together, we can be broken. We can be a mess. You know, we could have just had an argument in the car on the way here. All of that doesn't matter because we can be honest with the Lord, but we, we approach him honestly in spirit and in truth and he's always going to be there to bless that and so so i you know those are just some snapshots of where we are and where we're going uh, but i also wanted to reflect before we leave this this passage and we move on to chapter six next week lord willing that the lord sees fit to hold his people responsible and accountable now i'm not going to say anything that equals legalistic here or religious because that's not of the Lord. But let me just uh, capture some verses. When we talk about Adam and Eve, okay, husband and wife, the originals, uh, and, and how they're uh, used in Scripture, um, we might have a better understanding about responsibility and accountability. So in Romans 5.14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. You know, there's scripture that, that refers to Adam as the, the first man and, and Jesus as the second man, the perfect man, because he was God and man. But we see in that scriptures already alluding to the transgression of Adam. Okay, we're talking about responsibility and accountability. In 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 22, it says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Because of Adam, uh, the first one who sinned, if you will, we're all from Adam. We have his DNA. We have this sinful nature. We can't get away with, with that. You know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that's just a fact from the word. And so Adam, uh, through Adam we all die, but Christ is, he is the life giver. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Isn't that beautiful? 2 Corinthians eleven three. 3, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, in many ways, because of grace, it, uh, our salvation is somewhat easy. All I do is put my faith in a finished work of Christ. Uh, but it, did you notice how it says in that verse that Eve was deceived by his craftiness? 1 Timothy 2.13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. 1 Timothy 2.14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But isn't it interesting? Since that's true that the woman was deceived, but it's Adam who gets credit, if you will, or the responsibility or the accountability of sin. We see it in Scripture. In Galatians 3, 28 and 29, 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what supersedes what I've just read about Adam and Eve is Christ changed everything. He brought in a new covenant, uh, a new agreement, a binding agreement with his creation. And so it doesn't matter if you're male or female. We all come to him on level ground. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're at, at the foot of the cross on level ground. And so we're all saved by faith. It's not by good works. It's not by who we are. Uh, men have, do not have a higher standing in the view of God, nor do women uh, in that sense. Uh, but there is this sense of order. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, we see God the Father, then Christ his Son, then the man, then the woman. That's this divine order. But none of that means that the woman, uh, please hear me, has any less uh, love or importance in the eyes of our Savior. Do, do you understand that? So, so we all have uh, our responsibilities and accountability. So in many ways, when it says, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, it speaks a lot about the spiritual leader in the household. Okay? Now, now one thing that I know f firsthand is many households through the years that I've been a part of, uh, where there's uh, a, the woman is very much connected with the Lord, uh, trusting the Lord, and the husband has, has kind of dropped the ball, the Lord will raise up a spiritual leader, and many times it will be the wife. But apparently, uh, in God's view, the original idea was the, the husband would be the spiritual leader. That doesn't, there's, that doesn't lessen who the woman is. That's just from God. And so, so I know this can cause more questions than answers, and I, I kind of hope that happens. I'm hoping that some of you women will come to Gail and my wife on Tuesdays and Thursdays and ask questions. I'm hoping I'm going to get phone calls from, from you guys and say, well, what about this? What does this look like? Uh, the foundation of everything that we're going to be uh, in answer would be the word of God. Uh, to me, when I'm told to make disciples of all nations, uh, that's everyone. Everyone that's born again. It's not just the pastor. You know, the weight of ministry should not only be in the pastor. In fact, we've already read in Ephesians that a pastor teacher uh, is really put in place as a gift to a body of people, the bride of Christ, uh, until we all come into the unity of the faith. And maybe that will never happen until we're face to face with our Lord. I don't know. I don't know of any church that, that uh, made it to this perfect place of unity in the faith. But we can grow in that. You know, we, even the letter in Revelation uh, to, to Ephesians, um, you know, they did many things well. They worked very, very diligently. But, but the one thing that they dropped was their first love. And the Lord said, go back to your first love. So it's based on the foundation of Christ's love to us. He who loves us, you know, uh, and it's Christ himself. And so, so hopefully that's encouraging to you. But hopefully uh, you're going to be like that Berean in Acts chapter 17. You know, be in the word. Uh, let the word be your daily food. Uh, Job said that I, I viewed it as my daily food even, you know, it was more necessary than my daily food. And so I think that's, that's a beautiful way to, to look at the word. But, but when your faith starts to dwindle, get in the word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Amen? Okay. So that will be it for the lesson today.